The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 14915 in the name of Alison Johnson on remembering conscientious objectors. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Alison Johnson to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. <coughs> Just over 100 years on from the end of the First World War, there have been many events to mark what was then known as the war to end all wars. In communities across Scotland and far beyond, people have been reflecting on the first industrialised war, in which as many as 19 million people died. It is important that we remember, each in our own way, perhaps for different reasons, the millions of people who have died in conflicts in the past, and that we recognise the devastating loss caused by conflicts which continue to rage across the globe today. It is important that we pay our respects too to those who object to war on moral, political and religious grounds because they have made and are still making their own sacrifice. When it became apparent by the end of 1915 that the First World War would be prolonged, that more soldiers were needed, the Military Service Act of March 1916 introduced conscription to the UK. For those whose views, beliefs and conscience demanded of them that they didn't fight, conflict with the expectations of government and society was extremely challenging. Those who appealed against military service faced local tribunals who decided between conscience or cowardice. The first six months of the Act saw more than 750,000 cases being heard by tribunals, of which only a small number were recognised as legitimate. And from March 1916 until the end of the war, only 16,000 men were registered as conscientious objectors and given alternative service of national importance. Conscientious objectors endured ostracism. They risked their livelihoods, their reputations. In 1914, the Order of the White Feather tried to shame men not in uniform into signing up by branding them cowards, presenting them with a white feather. In some cases, their own families couldn't understand their stance and, and shunned them too. Conscientious objectors were forced into highly dangerous jobs. They were used as forced labor. They broke rocks for months on end. They endured brutal conditions in prison where they suffered terrible treatment from warders and other prisoners. 73 First World War objectors died in prison. But there were also many tens of thousands not then eligible for military service who objected to war and campaigned for peace, including women. The Women's Peace Crusade was founded in Glasgow in 1916, campaigning for an end to war and for a just peace. In particular, they campaigned against a punitive peace settlement. Crystal Macmillan, a great Edinburgh figure, a pioneer in so many fields, travelled to The Hague in 1915 to participate in a conference of the Women's International League that called on the warring countries of Europe to stop fighting. She went on to be a delegate to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. But this principled struggle against war and for peace continues today. Britain was one of the first countries to scrap military conscription, but over 40 countries around the world still do conscript their citizens into military service. And some which had previously scrapped the practice have reintroduced it. And it remains the case today that many people are still forced to make a decision between performing a role they object to on sincerely held religious, political or moral grounds or being punished, sometimes with imprisonment. And with 50 wars going on around the world right now, tens of millions of people remain active in peace movements. And that's why I wholeheartedly welcome the work of the Edinburgh Peace and Justice Centre and others to place in Princess Street Gardens a memorial to conscientious objectors and to all who oppose war. There are 37 war memorials in Edinburgh, eight of them in the gardens, from the Royal Scots Monument to the stone commemorating the volunteers from Lothian and Fife who fought in the Spanish Civil War. We rightly remember those who have died in war, but there's no memorial to those who have objected to war and struggled for peace. Several such memorials exist in London, there's one in Cardiff. That you're, there's none in Edinburgh or indeed in Scotland at all. From conscientious objection in the First and Second World Wars through protests against the Vietnam War to Scotland's resistance to the Iraq War, our country has a long and proud history of principled objection to war and it is long past time that this is recognised in our capital city in Scotland. Now, the Peace and Justice Centre has been working very hard indeed to find the right design for the memorial, to win permission for it to be built, 
and to fundraise to meet the cost of design and construction. And I'm particularly pleased that a design by award-winning Edinburgh artist Kate Ive has been chosen. Kate has designed a beautiful tree sculpture, a bronze tree sculpture, and it will become the first piece of art by a woman to be on permanent display in Princess Street Gardens. The tree's bronze flowers are based on those of the dove tree, and the dove tree's flowers are said to look like handkerchiefs. And Kate was inspired by the story of a no conscription fellowship meeting in London in 1916 in support of conscientious objectors and war resistors. An aggressive crowd was gathered outside, threatening to break in. So the chair asked the 2,000 attendees to wave their handkerchiefs instead of clapping to avoid further angering the crowd. Handkerchiefs were also a common item sent by families to their loved ones fighting on the front lines during the two world wars. There'll be a small granite stone at the heart of each flower and the bench that will be built alongside will also be made from Aberdeen granite to commemorate the death of Scottish conscientious objector, 20-year-old Walter Roberts, who died at the Dice work camp where inmates were forced to quarry granite in dangerous conditions. The sculpture, which is intended to be in place by August 2019, because that's the centenary of the end of imprisonment of First World War uh, objectors. Um, you know, the sculpture is intended to be in place by then. And I'd really like to thank the City of Edinburgh Council for their willingness to place, to put the memorial in the heart of this World Heritage Site, in the heart of our capital city. Because it's right that local people and visitors alike are afforded an opportunity to reflect on the possibilities of peace building and conflict resolution on the traditions of individual liberty and internationalism. Um, yes, thank you. Neil Finlay. Um, just to um, say that, you know, obviously we hope to get the widest possible support for the, the proposal, but uh, um, I think it's important to say that um, it's, it's not just pacifists who would support um, the erection of, of a memorial. There's many people who would, um, in certain circumstances, agree with taking up arms, taking up conflict in certain circumstances, but they should be welcome to support this as well. I agree, wholeheartedly. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly with Mr Finlay's contribution and welcome it. Um, I'd like to thank the City of Edinburgh Council for their willingness to, to adopt um, this proposal because it is right that, that this opportunity to reflect is available in this city. Um, I want to live in a Scotland where uh, that is globally recognised as a beacon of peace and inclusion. And I wrote to the councils to support this proposal last year and I warmly welcome the progress that has been made, but there's more to do. Presiding officer, I will <laughs> begin to wind up, um, but I'd like to thank the Edinburgh Peace and Justice Centre for leading this effort, um, along with many other groups, the Muslim Women's Association of Edinburgh, Edinburgh Stop the War, Edinburgh CND, St. Thomas of Aquin Secondary School, um, and uh, the, um, the, the Quakers and representatives of some of these organisations are with us in the gallery today. We rightly remember those who have died in conflicts, and so too, must we remember those who have and continue to work for peace because they too sometimes make sacrifices with their own lives and they deserve to be rem re remembered. And we all deserve a space in which to reflect on that contribution. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the open debate. Mr Finlay, some of your um, fellow members found it difficult to hear you, which is fairly unusual. <laughs> Could you pull your microphone in a wee bit? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, speeches of four minutes, please. We're quite tight for time. Bill Kidd, followed by Maurice Corey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you very much to Alison Johnson uh, for bringing the topic of con conscientious objectors uh, forward for debate. And thanks very much <clears throat> to the Edinburgh Peace and Justice Centre and others uh, for their proposals for the memorial. Since the early 20th century, <clears throat> pardon me, we have seen the contribution of conscientious objectors take many forms during periods of conscription. The Military Service Act of 1916, which brought in conscription for 18 to 41-year-old unmarried men, stipulated that individuals could appeal to civil courts over the grounds of conscientious objection. Before the Military Service Act of 1916, pacifists, many of whom would become conscientious objectors, protested against the escalating arms race and then against the outbreak of war. According to the opposing war memorial project, many thousands marched on Glasgow Green <clears throat> in opposition to the outbreak of what was then called by some the Great War. And it is this instinct to stand up for what you believe to be right 
which is essential for our democracy. So in the context of remembering World War I, how do we recognise conscientious objectors, individuals who face shame and many difficulties in the pursuit of peace? Through the tribunal courts, around 16,000 men, as has been mentioned uh, by Alison Johnson, appealed as conscientious objectors from 1916 to 1918. Many of these men joined the army in non-combatant roles and many others went to prison and labour camps. The opposing war memorial's goal of creating a memorial in Princes Street Gardens is an excellent way of recognising this wide-ranging group of people. It brings to our attention another side of history from World War I, one that is not taught widely or in, is in the public eye. It echoes, for example, the feeling of 200,000 who demonstrated in Trafalgar Square following the extension of conscription to include married men. Aside from the opposing war memorial, collections of primary sources and personal testimonies of conscientious objectors are also important in helping us to understand the decision to object to the objectionable. In October, the BBC ran an, an illuminating article detailing the plight of conscientious objectors, and this, a letter recently gifted to Glasgow Caledonian University, was highlighted. Robert Climey from Kilmarnock, the author of the letter, wrote to his baby daughter Cathy in November of 1917. Robert was originally granted exemption from service on the grounds of conscientious objection. However, this ruling was overturned at a later point. Robert was arrested, court-martialed, sent to prison, <clears throat> and in spring of 1917, he was sent to a labour camp at Kruachan in Argyll, near Loch Awe, to work in forestry. <clears throat> in the letter, he tried to explain to his daughter why he had been imprisoned. This moving letter has now caught the attention of many Scots who otherwise were unaware of stories such as his. Other primary sources tell the stories of those who contributed to the First World War in non-combatant military service. This included running stretchers to wounded soldiers on the front in an effort to save lives, and many lost their own lives in doing so. Others volunteered to help civilians caught within the conflict on the continent. And websites like White Feather Diaries and other online sources provide examples of doctors traveling to France and remote parts of Russia to help civilians with scant medical resources and no trained medics amidst the throngs of war. History telling through sources, stories and memorials can recognize those whose hearts were turned to peace. This noble end is the common denominator of the wide ranging testimonies of conscientious objectors who deserve to be remembered. Thank you. Maurice Corey, followed by Neil Finlay. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> I thank Alison Johnson for bringing this motion to debate this afternoon in the Chamber. I am pleased uh, to speak on this matter, remembering conscientious objectors. Uh, even though we may have our differences of opinion on the need for war, I entirely believe that the memory of conscientious objectors should be honoured and respected accordingly. I welcome the upcoming memorial in Princes Street Gardens proposed by the Edinburgh Peace and Justice Centre. This will create a space in which conscientious objectors and the value of international peacemakers should be remembered and reflected upon. Let me be clear, conscientious objectors should have and always should do the right to not participate in war. Conscientious objection is now a recognized human right by the United Nations and the European Court of Human Rights, which many countries support. In the First World War, as in any war, conscientious objectors acted by conviction. This could have been founded upon religious belief or political activism, and some disagree with government interventions while others believed it was wrong to kill in any instance. They should always have had that freedom to do this, to purely follow their conscience regarding peace. Their resistance was not harmful or cowardly, it was principled. This is what the memorial in Princess Street seeks to represent, that every person should have the right to offer alternatives to war, such as through conflict resolution or peace building, even though sometimes this may be incredibly difficult. Conscription in Scotland, as well as, well as internationally, would place heavy burdens on conscientious objectors. In the First World War, there were nearly 20,000 conscientious objectors, with 235 men from Edinburgh refusing conscription. This figure tripled in the Second World War. Their unfair treatment by authorities and indeed by their own communities should never have happened. And this has been referred to already by previous speakers. Tribunals were often unfair in their decision making and failed to make their personal stances seriously. 
In many cases, conscientious objectors were all still forced into war that they would still did not want to be part of. Some were wrongly treated as deserters, which, treated, which resulted in prison sentences. In total, 6,000 were sent to prison during the First World War, and here they faced harsh and degrading a, a treatment with a minimal diet. Some endured solitary confinement. Those who went on hunger strike risked the possibility of being force fed, but it is the psychological damage which seems to have had the most important effect on conscientious objectors. They risked the backlash of social isolation in their communities and accusations of betrayal from their own communities. This could foster feelings of shame and doubt in the face of suspicion and pressure. Conscientious objectors should not have been treated as lesser individuals, but valued members of society who serve the nation in other ways and on which they base their principles. Today, it is a relief to know that the conscientious objection is treated more respectfully, as it should be. I am glad that in our nation, this old feeling is no longer the case. And I know that today, conscientious objectors here are treated with the thought and care they deserved years ago. For example, the fact that the armed forces recruitment today is entirely voluntary ensures that every individual within it is not forced to be there and is free to make that choice. We should be respectful of the motivations and belief of, of, of both those who choose to join our armed forces and those who do not. Conscientious objectors who should not have been treated as lesser individuals but valued members of society and who could serve the nation in other ways. Rather than ignoring the stance of conscientious objection, this memorial will publicly represent their commitment and principles for peace. It is most definitely fitting that a memorial will hopefully be installed in, by August 2019, the centenary of the end of imprisonment for conscientious objectors during the First World War. And I hope the fundraising efforts will help the project to raise awareness for these individuals. Amidst the multiple memorials across the capital, which remember those who fought in the war, it is right that a space should be created to remember international peacemakers as well as conscientious objectors who face risks based on their principles. And to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is just as important to remember those who died in, in the war as to remember those who suffered from opposing war. And despite these differences, as I say as a veteran myself, the two, <coughs> the two should go hand in hand, both with sacrifices that point towards hope for peace. And that is what I believe this memorial will represent. Thank you. Neil Finlay, followed by Patrick Harvey. Thanks, President Officer. When a country goes to war, it's often on the back of a great deal of propaganda, pressure, media coverage, and the state influence of public opinion. That's the, the nature of the build-up to any war, the might of the government machine and pers uh, persuasive forces allied to it are rolled out to bang the drum and build public support for conflict. And the First World War, as Alison Johnson referred to, I think is a prime example of this, and it's where conscientious objectors came to the public's consciousness. These people against that backdrop of impending war took a very brave and principled stance opposing conflict on the grounds of their moral, religious or political views. They were neither cowards nor deserters nor unpatriotic, the people of great integrity, humanity and deeply held uh, conviction. Many of them lost their liberty as a result. Um, some driven by strongly held Christian or Jewish or Islamic faith and for groups like the Quakers, the literal interpretation of thou shalt not kill informed uh, their stance. Others driven by deeply held political principles. And, and at the forefront of these was, was the ILP, the Independent Labour Party, one of the founding organisations of the modern Labour Party. Keir Hardy was, of course, one of the greatest critics of the march to war and played a very prominent role in the anti-war movement. And the General Secretary of the ILP at that time, uh, Albert Inkpin said, as a socialist and internationalist, I'm strongly opposed to the war, which I regard as arising from the conflict of capitalist interests and as inimical to the welfare of the working class. Given the deaths of so many young working class men and women, then these words were indeed prophetic. The ILP newspaper, the Labour leader, led opposition uh, to the war, promoting the no conscription Fellowship and a number of leading labour movement activists uh, uh, ended up in prison as a result of their anti war activity. Some going on to become ILP MPs, people like Fenner Brockway, Emrys Hughes, and James Maxton. They were driven by a class analysis of the conflict, a belief that war was about economics, resources, and power, and that it was always the wealth owning capitalist class that always declared wars, but the working class that were sent to fight them. Certainly. 
Gillian Martin. Uh, would, would the member also recognise that one of the founder members of the Scottish National Party, Ro Muirhead, was also, along with, with the people that you mentioned there, involved in that effort? Delighted Neil to Finley. be informed of that by Gillian Martin. This, this, every day is a school day. Um, uh, and their actions uh, were also supported by the likes of Mary Barber leading the rent strikes in Glasgow and John, McLe John McLean and Willie Gallagher leading opponents of the war. <coughs> Indeed, this week um, sees the 100th anniversary of McLean's release from Peterhead Prison, uh, and he had initially been arrested under the Defence of the Realm Act. His oration from the dock uh, is now famous or infamous, however you look at it. Um, he sta stated, no human being on the face of the earth, no government is going to take from me my right to speak, my right to protest against wrong, my right to everything that is for the benefit of mankind. I'm not here then as the accused. I'm here as the accuser of capitalism, dripping with blood from head to foot. Presiding officer, the role of conscientious objectors is a very important part of our social uh, and political history. They should be remembered and acknowledged. The memorial in Princess Street Gardens would, would join many others, as Alison Johnson has mentioned, and I uh, would refer again to the uh, International Brigades Memorial that sits in the gardens as well. That's why I made the point that it is not just pacifists who support this. I think it's right we acknowledge our history and the people who have gone before us and that the memorial to those who stood by their principles and honourably opposed war, uh, the war that was supposed to end all wars, I think is the right thing to do. <coughs> Patrick Harvey, followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful to have the, the chance to participate uh, in this debate that's been brought by my colleague Alison Johnson. The debate, as the memorial, I hope, will, gives us the opportunity to reflect uh, on some difficult and complicated issues. And I've felt conflicted in recent months as we've marked the 100th anniversary of the armistice. And I think it's important to reflect on some of the complexities around that rather than to have a, a simplistic uh, commemoration of, of remembrance, uh, almost as though it becomes a ritual, uh, an unthinking ritual. It's always problematic to judge historical events through today's moral context. That context changes. But it is important when we remember those historical events that we discuss how the context has changed. The First World War was a time before the development of human rights law, before the development of much international law. It was a time in which racist, imperialist governments were absolutely the norm throughout Europe and almost unchallengeable uh, in terms uh, of that racism, racism and imperialism and the state violence which they felt entitled to perpetrate on their own citizens and on those around the world. Governments felt that they had and were regarded as having the right to round up their own citizens, march them to war, uh, and see them sent to their deaths. But while accepting that we are judging those historical events from a modern perspective, we have to, especially in moments of shared remembrance, reflect on what's changed as well. One of the first big political events just before I, I was elected here was, of course, the protests in relation to the Iraq war. And I had the opportunity to, to speak in front of a crowd of 100,000 people taking to the streets in Glasgow, marching against that war. A generation which viewed its inalienable right to express its view, its opposition to war, and to weapons of mass destruction, as many of us still campaign against. We regarded, and people have a right to regard, the government as their servant, not their master in these issues. But I know that it was easy for me to do that. It felt safe and easy. And I don't know whether I would have had the courage if I'd been born in a previous time, if I'd been raised in the years before the First World War, I don't know what, uh, whether I would have had the courage of what I now regard as my convictions. I don't know whether I would have had the insight to recognize that this was not a war between countries. This was a war being perpetrated by governments against their citizens, by governments on both sides against the citizens of both sides. I hope that I would have had that insight, and I hope that I would have had that courage, but I can't know. 
And I can only empathize with those around the world who are still faced with being the subject of war and state violence perpetrated by those who are being armed by our country and others. These issues are always in my mind when we think about the, the role of the red poppy and the white poppy. And I will continue to argue that there has to be a place for both in our acts of shared remembrance. Remembrance, yes, has to include a recognition and a, a, a reflection on the value and, and the lives, the memories of those who fought and who, who lost their lives, whether they regarded themselves as making a sacrifice or whether we regard them as they're having their lives sacrificed by their own governments. Uh, and I regret to say that, as, as Neil Finlay is, is probably right, as we see the rise of fascism in North and South America and in parts of Europe at the moment, there may be times again when people are forced uh, into feel that they have no other option but to take up arms against that kind of government. But the bravery, the courage, the conviction, uh, the sacrifice and the principle of those who oppose war is absolutely essential to be a part of our shared acts of remembrance, just as those who participate in war. So I commend the Peace and Justice Center and all of their colleagues, including the University of Edinburgh, the Iona community, the Muslim Women's Association of Edinburgh, and many others for their work. This memorial, when it is in place, will offer us the space, offer everyone in Scotland the space to do what we are doing now, to reflect on difficult and contended, contested issues in relation to our attitudes to war and to the value of those around the world who work for peace. Mark MacDonald, followed by Gillian Martin. Uh, can I congratulate Alison Johnson on securing this debate? Uh, I signed her motion and I'm fully supportive uh, of the campaign. Um, on the 18th of November this year, uh, a play was performed at Dice Parish Church in my constituency, a play entitled This Evil Thing, uh, a solo play uh, written and performed by the award-winning actor Michael Mears, uh, telling the story of Britain's World War I conscientious objectors. Um, the play includes a scene set at the work camp uh, established in Dice uh, by the government uh, in 1916. Alison Johnston alluded to it uh, in her speech, and I want to focus uh, my contribution around uh, the Dice work camp. Um, the camp was established on the 23rd of August uh, 1916 uh, and uh, involved 250 men being transported to Dice uh, to be put to work in the quarries, breaking up granite stones, uh, if essentially to be used in the road building uh, endeavours. Uh, the local authority was not informed about what was happening uh, and the press did not find out about the camp's existence until the 9th of September. Now, Alison Johnson mentioned uh, Walter Roberts, who died at the Dice camp. Uh, like most workers, uh, he developed a cold upon arrival, uh, and on the 6th of September, he dictated a letter to his mother uh, from the camp. I want to quote that uh, from that letter. Um, As I anticipated, it has only been a matter of time for the camp conditions to get the better of me. Bartle Wilde is now writing to my dictation because I am now too weak to handle a pen myself. I don't want you to worry yourself because the doctor says I have only got a severe chill, but it has reduced me very much. All these fellows here are exceedingly kind and are looking after me like bricks, so there is no reason why I should not be strong in a day or two when I will write more personally and more fully. He died on the Friday of pneumonia. During the course of his illness, he had fallen from his bed and spent two hours on the cold floor of his tent uh, was not seen uh, by a medical professional uh, and therefore um, was not afforded medical attention uh, in order to possibly save his life. And the Aberdeen Daily Journal uh, reported his death um, in, uh, on the 12th of September, uh, but also carried uh, an editorial on uh, the next page uh, about the conscientious objectors. And that editorial was headlined Dice Humbugs and uh, contained the following passage. The conscientious objector in wartime is a degenerate or worse, who is out of harmony with the people of the nation which protects him in peacetime and safeguards him in wartime. And the no conscription fellowship which champions these shirkers of their duty is under so deep a cloud of suspicion that no fewer than 27 raids by the police have been made within the past week or so on the houses of secretaries and members in the London area. And I think it's interesting to note presiding officer, that rather than focusing on the conditions in which these men uh, were being forced to endure at the camp, 
the focus was rather uh, on why these men were deserving of the conditions in which they found themselves. And that was the focus that the press chose to take. Uh, future Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald visited the Dice camp uh, himself and uh, reported in Parliament on the 19th of October, two, uh, 19 of October 1916 uh, regarding uh, what he had seen. Uh, he said, then take the men at work. You go up to the end and you see 20 or 30 men, the most extraordinary creatures you ever saw. First of all, they looked as if every one of them had been 20 years on the road, and yet behind it all you saw the intellectual class of the men. It is a strange sort of combination of the intel intellectual life and the tramp. The men felt it very keenly. One man I talked to about it almost broke down when I tried to joke about his personal appearance. He later said there were these men, about 100, doing work they were not trained to do, doing work they could not do, doing work they could not be trained to do, going under the impression that this is national service. And the point was that this was dressed as national service, but in reality was punishment uh, of conscientious objectors. The camp closed on the 25th of October 1916, had been open for only two months. And I raise, the, raise this in the chamber tonight alongside the motion Alison Johnson has raised because I grew up in DICE. And until I was an adult, I knew nothing of this part of our history in our community. It wasn't talked about. It wasn't something that we learned about. We learned about the RAF being stationed in DICE during World War, World War II. And it was almost as though we could only talk about the aspects of war which were considered to be glorious as part of our history, rather than those which ought to give us pause for thought, reflection, and in rightly, I think, a sense of shame for what these men had to endure. So I support the campaign by Alison Johnson. I hope it will help to encourage greater awareness of what happened in relation to the work camp at DICE and in terms of the conscientious objectors movement more widely. Gillian Martin, followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to Alison Johnson for bringing this important debate and it gives us the opportunity to recognise some of the people uh, who were conscientious objectors. You know, pacifist movements can change the course of political action. The conscientious objectors of the Great War were the genesis of the peace movement as we know it today, a peace movement which is the bulwark against overzealous governments, a national conscious when ill-advised decisions on aggressive interventions are taken in wars that we have no business being involved in. And Alison Johnson has already outlined the examples of the type of war that I allude to. It's only right that there's a memorial to those who stood up for peace at a time, but that meant being attacked and ridiculed by members of the public, being taken away from your family, being imprisoned, being put in labour camps, and in some cases being tortured and abused. And as we know, in some cases, when they were forced into conscription, shot and killed by their own government for refusing to follow orders or suffering trauma. And when we talk of bravery, we must not ignore the bravery of the conscientious objectors of the so-called Great War. They were brave. They were brave too. They stood up for what they believed in, peace. And heroism takes many forms. And amongst the heroes who fought in the trenches must stand the heroes who fought to stop the senseless war in which so many young men died in the name of something we still can't really put our finger on. You just have to look at, at the propaganda images and letters to the newspapers uh, of the day portraying these men. The characterisation them, of them is appalling and offensive. How brave to stand up for your beliefs and face being punished and ostracised from society. And having your family ridiculed as a result as well, which a lot of people do forget, it would impact on your whole family. And just um, as, as Mark McDonald has mentioned about the dice camps, just a, a mile beyond the border of my constituency, and hundreds uh, of English conscientious objectors were sent from prisons to live in horrific conditions. They spent their days breaking granite in a nearby quarry, sleeping on cold, wet ground in ragged, damaged tents that had been used in the Boer War. And conditions were so bad, and we've already heard about the 20-year-old man, Walter Roberts, and it really struck me when I was reading about Walter Roberts, because it's whenever I read about the First World War, the ages of the men really get to me, because my son is 20 years old, and that's the thing that really sticks in my craw. And, and that letter that he wrote to his mother um, nearly had me in tears, because I'm imagining the sort of letter, opening that letter, and then finding out that her son had died days later. Um, and Walter died because of his religious beliefs. He was a Christian. That's why he objected to war. Um, and he should have been exempted from conscription for that reason, but he was not. Um, and I want to close by quoting from a letter from another person that was mentioned in the debate by Bill Kidd, uh, Robert Climey. Um, I want to quote from the letter. Robert Climey had long held pacifist beliefs and he was not exempted. He actually, he, he, he was exempted initially, 
but someone, uh, an ex-army officer, took against the decision so bad he campaigned to have his exemption overturned, and he had been sent to Wormwood Scrubs. Um, he wrote to his baby daughter, she turned one years old, and he'd missed her first year of life um, because of his imprisonment. And uh, I just want to read you what, what he said in his letter to his daughter, which he assumed that she would read later on in her life. The first year of your life will in later years be known as one of the worst years in the history of the world. A most fearful war is raging. The war just now is divided into nations, and the people of each nation believe themselves to be fighting on behalf of their own particular country. However, there are men and women who believe that all men and all women are brothers and sisters. These people are known as pacifists. And I'd, I'd urge everyone to listen to Robert Climie's full letter as read by the actor Gary Lewis. You just have to go online to, to find it. It's heartbreaking, but it is heroic. In closing, I want to put on record my thanks to the Edinburgh Peace and Justice Centre for all the hard work campaigning to give those heroes for peace the recognition they deserve. And going some way, a small way, and allowing us to make a small amount of amends for the heartbreak they and their families endured, along with those who did go to war. Thank you, President Officer. And the last of the open debate contributions is from Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I too would like to thank Alison Johnson for bringing forward this debate because I think it's an important one for all the reasons that have been set out by members. Because it's important to remember not just those who uh, died uh, in, uh, bearing arms for our country, but also those who fought for the principle of peace. Because I think I'm very conscious standing here being someone who's of a generation who's had no immediate or even indirect contact with that mass mobilization that wars uh, in the 20th century brought. None of my immediate family, not my grandparents nor my parents fought. And I think as we reflect on the 100 year anniversary of World War I, I, I find it truly unimaginable. And much of the, the, the memorial, much of the thoughts and the things that have been said about the 100, uh, the 100 year anniversary of the First World War have focused on the truly unimaginable experience of that war. And, and that is truly unimaginable. And I think Patrick Harvey set out very well that the industrial nature of that conflict was horrifying, but equally as confounding was the rationale for that war. Now, it's not just that I was a bad history student that I don't understand why that war came about, but the very fact that it gets hung upon the assassination of a, an aristocrat uh, in a, at a far off place that and that somehow explains this complicated interwoven uh, uh, interests of imperial powers and uh, treaties that brought about a truly horrifying slaughter of millions. I don't understand that and I don't want it to ever be the case that that could ever justify uh, that situation again. So that is why we must remember that. And while World War I did not end all wars, it certainly did bring into being a world order, a different sort of world that we live in today, so that those of us here today have not had to experience mass mobilization. And conflict may not have been ended, but that sort of global conflict, hopefully, is unthinkable. So that is why we must thank conscientious objectors, because my politics, is based on that fundamental principle of uh, int internationalism. I fundamentally believe in a, a global system of institutions that hopefully makes war far less likely, if not impossible, on the scale that we've seen in the 20th century. And it's thanks to those individuals that had that courage to stand up for those principles of peace that we, can, that we have those institutions. And I too would like to reflect, as Neil Finlay did, on, on some of the contributions that people from my party made, and, and in particular Arthur Woodburn, who was the Secretary of State for Scotland in the Clement Attlee government from 1947 to 1950. And he was exempted. He had a, a kidney condition and was a, 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 had an occupation which meant that he would, did not need to serve. But nonetheless, he registered with the authorities as a conscientious objector, was imprisoned from 1916, and in the latter months of the war, went on hunger strike. That is true courage and true conviction to put yourself in that position. And I remember him also because he stood in Edinburgh South in 1929. And that is perhaps, I think, the importance of the memorial. And I think it's those twin uh, uh, objectives to remember those who had that courage, who suffered for the courage of their convictions, but to also, I think, honor that ideal that ideal of world, world peace and the fact that we all do need to struggle and strive for it. So I too would like to thank 
the Edinburgh uh, 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 just, uh, Peace and Justice Centre for their work. And I truly hope that before long we have that memorial in Pinterest Street Gardens because I think it's an important one. Thank you. I call Ben McPherson to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And first of all, thank you for myself to Alison Johnson for putting forward this motion, allowing us to have this Im important debate. I think it has been really an, an illuminating and interesting debate in terms of the quality, the sensitivity and the depth of contributions and also the personal reflections and particularly fitting uh, a week after St Andrew's Day where, uh, as Alistair McIntosh emphasised in his St Andrew's Day lecture on Friday, uh, our patron saint was of course an advocate for non-violence and uh, somebody who, who, who put that forward. In terms of uh, responding, I, I will in a moment, but also just like to reflect on some of the contributions from a personal perspective in that I, I, I was, was there when Patrick Harvey addressed the, the, the uh, protests against the Iraq war in, in 2003 and remember that powerfully. But I also think of my own family's journey within the peace building and peacemaking movements there, um, some of my relatives' engagement in the, in the Quaker movement, and also my great-great-grandfather, Dr. Walter Walsh, who was an anti-war campaigner and campaigned uh, against the Boer War with a, a certain James Keir Hardy in the, in the, in the, in the 19th century. So uh, feeling uh, very much uh, connected to this debate from a personal perspective, as others are. I'm also heartened that there's consensus around the chamber with a shared appreciation for the Edinburgh Peace and Justice Centre and others involved in this project. And would like to pay my own respect and appreciation to the work that you've done, not just on this project, but that you do more generally and have often uh, in been inspired both at St John's and indeed walking past by the very powerful messages that are portrayed on the, the outside of St John's. The last four years have seen a nationwide program of commemorations to mark the centenary of World War I with hundreds of community groups and organisations involved in events the length and breadth of Scotland to pay tribute to all those involved in the conflict. And the Scottish Government commemorations panel uh, chaired by Professor Norman uh, Drummond have recommended and produced commemorations to mark events and battles of World War I with particular significance for Scotland. And through the commemorations program, uh, the people of Scotland have learnt about the effects of war and its lasting impact on life in Scotland today. It is right that we recognise the impact that this war and other wars had on the whole of Scottish society. Uh, and the great sacrifices made by hundreds of thousands of military personnel and their families. But there were also many other individuals and groups in society who were deeply affected by the great war and others, as we are appreciating today. The sheer scale of those impacted is very hard for us to comprehend. Many of those injured suffered psychologically in a time which often didn't fully recognize or support those with mental health needs. Some who suffered from shell shock and other mental health issues were subjected to inhumane treatment and were condemned by society on their return. And we also recognise the deeply held views, as we are today, by those who chose not to fight on a range of, re of, of, of reasons from religious, political and humanist grounds. Indeed, they also faced similar unfair condemnation by society. Although records are reportedly incomplete, it is estimated that around 16,000 people in the UK were conscientious objectors in World War I, and many thousands more in World War II until national service ended in the 1960s. The Scottish Government's World War I commemorative programme is remembering the broad impact that the Great War had on all parts of Scotland and beyond. Indeed, the Scottish Commemorations Panel has run several education days, each focusing on a different aspect of war to accompany those events. Uh, and to accompany these events, the panel pro uh, produced, uh, booklets, uh, pr produced booklets on the subject being covered. The first of these, in November 2015, covered recruitment, conscription, tribunals, and conscientious objectors. Uh, for example, it told the story of John McTaggart from Dundee, who claimed exemption from military service as he was politically opposed to the war. 
Uh, he ended up being sentenced to prison and went on to serve two years and seven months in prison before being released in April 1919. Presiding officer, many different events or groups of people may be commemorated on a memorial. Memorials can commemorate war, conflict, victory, peace, groups and individuals. Of course, yeah. Alison Johnson. I think it, it's clear that this memorial would aid reflection of many issues. Um, it's envisaged that there'll be an engagement programme for, for local schools and so on. Um, and I'd just be interested to learn how the government might help assist uh, the realisation of the memorial. Um, obviously, crowdfunding is going well, but, but more could be done. So I'd just be <coughs> grateful if the minister could respond to that. Thank you. Ben McPherson. Th thank Alison Johnson for that point. In terms of the, the support for the, uh, the opposing war memorial plan for, for Princess Street Gardens, uh, as has, has been said, I am pleased to hear that there is already widespread support for this initiative, both at a local government uh, and, uh, and uh, level and in, in terms of Edinburgh society and beyond. It has been a long-standing policy for both UK and Scottish governments uh, that the cost of maintaining memorials associated products cannot be met from public funds. Um, so I'm reassured that there are measures already in place uh, to raise the funds for its creation. If there are suggestions after this uh, debate that Alison Johnson wants to put to me uh, and the government, I'd be very uh, happy to receive those in writing and, 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 and to, to consider them in due course. Okay, yeah. Neil Finlay. I was listening carefully. You said uh, there's no finance to maintain is that include erect? Ben McPherson. The, the, po the point is, is, is well made. And in terms of the, as I said, there's, there's been a long tradition of both, uh, a policy rather, uh, from the UK and the Scottish governments around the costs. I cannot commit today to Scottish government funding support for such a memorial, but uh, if Alison Johnson wants to write to me in detail after this meeting, those uh, points around this can be considered in due course and I'd be happy to respond to that. And thank you, Neil Finlay, for that intervention. I'd like to close by thanking all members for their contributions. The Scottish Government believes that people of all faiths and none must be supported to follow their way of life without fear or discrimination or mistreatment. Yes, of course. Thank you. Minister, sorry, thank you, President Officer. Would the Minister uh, welcome the fact that since, for many years now, our mobilisation is to clarify of reservists, and they're the ones technically who are people within our community. Don't get me wrong, regular service personnel too come from our communities, but ones who are very close to the reservists who get called up. And we now have a system where we have a fairly permanent uh, call-up programme uh, to support our various operations overseas in the armed forces. Um, now, a lot of these, these operations are actually peace keeping operations. Um, nowadays, um, would the Minister agree with me that it's very good that, that reservists have to volunteer before they're called up? They're actually asked to volunteer before they allow their names to go forward to be called up. So therefore, there is an opportunity to express any reservations they may have. Ben McPherson. I, I acknowledge those points. I think um, the, the, the points are well made and, and, and on the record. And uh, I'm certainly sure that those will be re relayed to the uh, relevant Minister Graham Day for, for consideration. I would like to stick to the, the, the point on, on the memorial and, and the, the content of Alison Johnston's motion, which uh, I, I would clarify the, the point earlier does uh, cover uh, both the erection and the maintenance. So um, unfortunately, the, 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 there's a long held policy that uh, both uh, at UK government and Scottish government level that the costs of, of erection of such a memorial would, would not be uh, met from public funds. But it's really important that, uh, as members have contributed today, that people of all faiths and none are able to, to be supported to follow their way of life without fear or discrimination, and that we value and respect people's freedoms in important matters of conscience, including peace. Uh, and and as, as quickly as I can get there, uh, I will join with many others at St. John's for a, a multilingual European Christmas carol service in solidarity with European friends and partners and to remember, uh, amongst other things, the force that the EU has played, very positive force, 
in, uh, as a force for peace. And uh, this evening I will also reflect, as we have today, on the Edinburgh Peace and Justice Centre and all that it does to encourage peace and has done for many years and to promote social justice in Scotland and around the world. And in that spirit, I pay tribute to all involved in the Peace and Justice Centre and wish everyone involved, Alison Johnson, other members and everyone in wider society, uh, very well in the campaign to raise money for a memorial to all those who have been peacemakers, who have stood up so bravely and strongly in that endeavour and who have chosen to stand up for and promote non-violence. And I look forward to hearing more about the progress of this very important cause. Thank you. That concludes the debate and this meeting is closed.